My grandparents moved down to southern Florida, the Fort Lauderdale area, back in the early 2000s. As part of our family tradition, we spent almost every holiday with them. It was easy enough to ride along when I was a kid, but once I hit college, it became somewhat harder to go down from the Nashville area where I was going to school. It's a pretty straight shot, though, down I-75, but at the very bottom end of the highway, down in Florida, the road cuts straight across the state through Big Cypress Preserve and a pretty wild stretch of the Everglades. Even as a kid, it struck me as a strange place to build a highway, but it's undeniably scenic. Sometimes you even see alligators sunning themselves along the side of the highway. When we were younger and driving down with our parents, my older brother loved to taunt me about all the monsters living in the swamp, and I used to be petrified by the time we got to our grandparents' house. Meanwhile, Fort Lauderdale isn't exactly known for its creepy, crawly creatures, apart from some massive cockroaches, but that never really did much to calm my nerves. Anyway, during college, I was heading down one year for Thanksgiving. It was 2018. I remember specifically because it was the year before Nicole hit, and I didn't make it for the next few years after that. I was on my way down and was pushing harder than I should have to make it. Usually I split up the 14-hour drive into two days, but I had stayed a little longer in Nashville than I first anticipated. That meant I was over 12 hours in when I was crossing into the National Preserve, and admittedly, starting to get punchy. If I really pushed it, I would make it by midnight, which I know for sure my mom was hoping for. It was late in the day, and the sun had been down for so long that I felt like I'd been driving in the dark forever. No amount of passenger seat snacks or caffeine could keep me focused. Besides, once you start cutting through the preserves, especially in the dark, everything takes on this super surreal quality. The nights down there can get super muggy, too and thick fog can come up in a second and hang around in ways that make any kind of travel dangerous. So I was tearing my hair out, because all I wanted to do was floor it and cut across that last hour and a half. Instead, fog had me fighting my way through. So, yeah, maybe I was going faster than I should have been, but I felt sure that I would be able to see taillights or headlights in time to miss anything major. And then... All of a sudden, something leapt out of the fog less than 50 feet ahead of me, and I slammed on my brakes. The whole car threatened to go into a spin, and I yanked on the wheel to keep from slamming into the guardrail. It had happened. I was going to hit this thing in the road, and there was nothing I could do to stop it. Instinct took over, and I pulled the wheel hard to take the hit in the front passenger side, so that whatever it was didn't rocket across the hood and cave in the windshield. We hit hard and the thing let out a massive yelp and pitched over the shoulder and down into the gully. As I made contact, my heart got tight. In my panic, I hadn't gotten a good look at it, but even in that state, I could tell that it had been standing upright. So, I pulled over, and I got out of the car, terrified that I would look down over and see a person lying in the swamp. The passenger side headlight was busted, so that whole side of the road was dark. Now my father always insisted that I keep a flashlight in the glove box, so I got that out, and I went over to look down, and the first thing I noticed before seeing anything was the smell. Not exactly like something dead, but more like an ugly mix of B.O. and animal musk. I had to pull the front of my shirt up over my nose to even get close. My heart was pounding because it was definitely shaped like a person, but the more I looked the less that actually proved to be true. The proportions were super weird, like the arms seemed too long for the body. Plus, it was covered all over with this reddish hair like an orangutan. But the legs were too long for it to be that. Everything about it just seemed wrong. That, plus the smell. And all those stories my brother told when we were kids came rushing up like crazy. I know this sounds nuts, but I'm a thousand percent sure that this thing was a skunk ape. My hands started shaking and I climbed back into my car to call my dad to tell him what had happened. At that point, I didn't even know what the damage was to my car, and I felt far too rattled to drive right away. 
As soon as I sat down, though, this inhuman wailing started from off in the fog. Not just one, but several sounds, several voices. It was impossible to tell where they were all coming from, but I knew in an instant that whatever the issues with my car might be, there was no way I was waiting around. So against my better judgment, I kicked on my high beams to make up for the lost headlight and I hightailed it out of there, somehow making it to my parents, but with no memory of the drive. When I finally arrived there, my dad was waiting up for me, and it all came out. I started shaking and crying. I was crying so hard I woke everybody else up in the house. I think my dad at first thought I might have made it all up to keep from getting in trouble for wrecking the car or being later than I had wanted. but. There was no denying it when he saw me. And so now, we are all affected. There's an entire city floating on the Caspian Sea. It's sinking, but it's there. 300 kilometers of bridges, roadways, complexes, and oil rigs. I worked there for four years. It was a perilous and thankless job. Most of the world doesn't know that oil rocks exists. The money I made was good, though. It kept me out of trouble for a while, too. Unfortunately for me and every poor soul working these rigs, trouble came to oil rocks. It came for us, and we couldn't escape it. Out there, trouble rolled in like the fog. The first guy disappeared a year and a half in. He vanished off the side of the rig. No splash. No nothing. The ocean has a way of swallowing you whole, I guess. It's swallowing the whole city. Regardless, we should have known something was up then. They kept his disappearance quiet, the higher-ups. When we asked to review the security footage from the area he was working, they outright refused. Red flag, right? The thing about red flags is they're still so easy to ignore. It isn't red or green or any color at all if you decide to just look the other way. And sometimes it even takes time. Well, that's what we did looked the other way. We looked away and we went on with our lives, working in the middle of the Caspian Sea. After that disappearance, we had a few more months of peace. Then, we only had trouble. I wish I could say I had seen it first. I didn't. I did hear it, though. One night, the whole ocean sounded like it was croaking. It sounded like a sea of frogs. None of us could see anything in the dark water, but the company assured us that it was just the sound of migrating whales. Now, I've heard whales before. I've seen and studied whales. Those sounds were not coming from any whale that lives in our sea. It came back a couple of nights later, and this time there was a splash because we heard another man hit the water. At least we knew where to look. We got a flotation device in his arms, and we were hoisting him up in no time. A few blankets later, and the guy was right as rain, toasty and chatting us up. Escaping death is pretty exciting, I guess. He said somebody pushed him. He knew he'd been alone in the area, and every other guy was accounted for. Nobody living on oil rocks could have reached him, let alone thrown him over the railing. We mandated a buddy system after that. But Trouble didn't care about our buddy system. It came for us in twos. Two guys that I started with were the next to encounter the croaking thing from the Caspian Sea. They were attacked. Maimed would be a better description. The company had to bury their injuries under the guise of an equipment malfunction. We work with some heavy machinery, but nothing that could cut you like that guy got cut. It was ugly. They lived, as far as I know. Over the course of the next three weeks, more and more of us started to see it. My buddy described it as a man with a head of seaweed for hair. Others said it looked like an alien. I saw it one time, just the once, as it slipped off the rig and fell into the ocean. It's hard to describe, I guess. There's nothing to compare it to in a way that feels justified. It had arms like a man, and it had legs like a man. I thought I saw hands, webbed fingers, coming out of all four of those limbs. Its skin was thick and warty like a toad or a frog. I forget which one. Its stomach was bulbous and fat. Its eyes were wide-set, large and red. It turns my stomach just to think about that face. And it hurts to think about the long mouth and the rows of needlepoint teeth. It wasn't a whale, 
I'll tell you that much. It was a nightmare. I spotted it as it fled another point of attack. It had come for one of the ladies working at Oil Rocks. She was smarter than the rest of us, apparently, because she picked up a wrench and taught that thing a lesson. She was covered then in a mucus-like blood that certainly was not hers. And that was when the Iranians showed up. Government types. They only gave their credentials to our superiors. The rest of us just did what they said. Quarantine. Some of us were sent home, myself included. The lady covered in that mucus was hauled back to the mainland. I don't know what became of her, and I never wanted to ask. The last thing that she had said to any of us was, It's starting to burn. Can you imagine that? Being covered in the blood of something that tried to kill you, and the slime is starting to give you a rash? The way she said it, I'll never forget. Starting to burn. Starting. She was scratching and patting at her skin like smoke was coming off of it. And then they took her away. So if the burning was only starting, what came next? Did they take her to a hospital or a lab? I guess I'm just lucky that I wasn't with her. Over those next few weeks, we were forced to accept a very hard truth. Out there on oil rocks, we fancied ourselves the smartest things around. We went looking for privacy thinking we could demand it from nature. Nature had a different plan for us. Nature taught us that no matter how many bridges we build or how many rigs we stab into the earth, we are not the masters of the ocean or the land. We weren't even safe on the structures that we built. At any point in time, something can rush up from the dark and drag us back into the depths. I was on the police force in Minnesota for about 12 years. The town I was in was so far north that it was basically Canada. Summers were short and humid. Winters were absolutely brutal. In fact, most of the incidents I had to respond to in the winter months were related to bad road conditions in one way or another. This incident happened in the fall of 2010. It was cold, I remember, but there were only a couple of inches of snow on the ground at the time. I was called to investigate a case of property damage at a homestead deep in the woods. The report came in early that morning and said that there was significant damage to the woodshed. I asked if it looked like the perpetrator was an animal, in which case it would be a job for animal control instead. But the caller said there were footprints left behind. I cleared my schedule so I could head out right away. If there were footprints... I could get a size and a tread pattern, but I had to move quickly because as soon as the sun came up, it would start to melt the prints and they would get distorted beyond use. The homestead was an off-grid cabin set up deep in a pine forest. You couldn't see it from the road. In fact, you could barely see the driveway. The only reason I found the place was the lone mailbox at the end of the road. I didn't even see a fire number. I'll be honest, the guy who lived there was a bit odd. I mean, you'd have to be to live in this climate without electricity. He said he spent the last three days chopping wood for the winter as he was a little behind this year, and the woodshed was located about 50 yards from the house. The man claimed to have heard an animal moving around out there for the last two days, but he never saw anything. He thought now that it might have been the person who did the damage to the woodshed, but it didn't make much sense as to why someone would have any reason to attack a building. And it looked like an attack, like something you would expect from a bear. The whole side of the shed was torn off and scattered across the ground. Logs from the shed were strewn all over the property. I mean, all over the property. There were logs up near the house and just all over for as far as you could see. The man said he woke up in the night to the sound of the destruction outside, and he opened his door to take a look at what was going on. He claimed to have seen the back of a man who looked to be dressed in a white fur coat. As soon as he opened the door, though, he said the man ran off into the woods. He waited until morning to investigate the damage, and that's when he found the footprints. But here's the strange part. The prints are bare feet. I didn't believe him until he showed me. I mean, they were definitely human prints, although quite large, but that could be explained by the sun. When the sun hits footprints, they melt and get a little bigger. 
I took photos of the footprints and I walked around the perimeter of the shed to record the damage. As I was walking around the backside, I saw a white blur out of the corner of my eye. I spun around to get a better look. The only thing I saw was white fur running into the forest. This must be our guy, I thought. So I chased. I didn't realize until I was about 80 yards into the pine forest that I was not chasing a man. Now it looked like a man from behind, about my height and running on two legs, but it was not a man at all. It then stopped to face me, and it had an ape-like face. The skin around its face and hands were a sort of brownish tan, and the rest of the creature was covered in white hair. I drew my gun. I didn't know if it was going to attack me when it stopped running, but it just stood there, panting, almost like it was out of breath. I then moved my eyes down to its feet. No shoes. This was definitely the creature that destroyed the shed. I don't know what I was thinking, but I tried talking to it. But it was obvious that it didn't have any understanding of language. I still had my gun drawn on it. I slowly reached into my pocket to grab my phone to get a picture of this thing. But that's when it ran, and I didn't follow it that time. My encounter with the creature only lasted at max a few seconds, but it felt way longer than that. I couldn't believe what I had seen, and I had no idea what I was going to tell the man who owned the cabin. I mean, I couldn't put any of this in the police report. I'd probably get fired for suspicions of insanity or something. I couldn't tell the guy it was an animal either since he saw human footprints out there. I decided to protect my own butt and not say anything. I took down the report of the property damage and that was it. I did stay and help the man clean up the logs that had been scattered across his property and I don't know exactly why, since I had a bunch of other things I was supposed to do that day. I guess I felt guilty for not telling him about what I saw in his woods. I did check up on him again a few weeks later, and when I got there, the first thing I noticed was that the woodshed had been moved right next to the house. I asked about it, and he said the same thing happened two weeks later, two weeks after I left, and he said that he saw somebody out there in the woods but I wouldn't believe him if he told me what it looked like. What he says is the truth. So since he moved the shed away from the forest, he's now not had any issues. Hopefully, it'll stay that way. Have you ever seen a man change color? Well, maybe that isn't the right way to ask the question. I guess these days, tattoos and tans and medical treatments can do all that. But what I meant to ask was, has somebody ever changed color right before your eyes? I'm guessing probably not, unless you've seen the same things that I have. Let me tell you, though, I haven't met a person yet who has seen what I've seen. But I'd like to know that I didn't dream it up. I'd like to know that I've been right all along and not crazy like the rest of the world wants me to believe. My work has led me to a lot of places. You'll need to know why I was out in the middle of nowhere if you're going to believe the rest of this. I'm a contractor. I specialize in flooring installation. Carpet, wood, concrete. If you walk on it, I put it down. Everyone needs floors, you see. Even the government. Even in places they don't want many people to be walking. That's enough of the spooky, ominous meandering. To tell you the truth, I was excited to take the job. They were hiring a crew to lay down a new floor in a New Mexico aircraft hangar. Pay was extraordinary. It wiped out all of my debts, as a matter of fact. What I saw there, however, certainly wasn't covered in the job description. There were long stretches of time when my crew was monitored by a single guard. We were working overnights, long hours to get the hangar up and running as soon as possible. The government must not have seen the point in assigning a whole team of personnel to babysitting duty. Maybe they were nearby working on something else. There were certainly other things nearby. So two nights before our deadline hit, we saw them. The hangar's open side was facing the desert. Any other night, it was like staring into an abyss. When we were lucky, we would see the faint shimmer of a star. Fortunately for us, we hadn't taken the job for the view. Aside from the occasional smoke break, we didn't even step foot outside. This night, those smoke breaks were nearly the death of us. 
Shane went out to take the first break and came back yelling. He said he saw something walking out there. The guard instructed us to stay put to get back to work while he took his flashlight to check the perimeter. He came back empty-handed and warned Shane that one more outburst would get us all canned. Shane kept quiet after that. The guard, however, did not. Seemingly at random, just an hour or two later, he snapped his flashlight back on and broke into a sprint. He was running straight into the desert. There was no explanation. A few of us dropped our tools and watched, but none of us called out, especially not Shane. We watched his bobbing flashlight until we got so far that even it faded into the night. There's no chance we went back to working. Not after that. Instead, we approached the open doorway. We swung a few of our spotlights around to get a better look at the landscape. It didn't help. We still didn't call out, though, but we were watching for any signs of our government-approved babysitter. And after about 15 minutes passed, we started to chatter. We asked Shane to describe what he saw again. He said he saw a man. He said a naked man walking with a hunched back and hanging limbs. One of us remarked that we were dealing with a zombie. I don't remember who said it, but honestly, a zombie would have been easier. A few minutes later, and Shane spoke again. This time he pointed for our eyes to follow, and our gazes all landed on the silhouette of the guard. He was finally lumbering back to the hangar. His back was hunched. His arms were hanging. As his silhouette entered the glow of the spotlight, I noticed something weird. I don't know how many of the other guys saw it. We didn't ask or say anything after the job was over. The details of his uniform, the button breast pocket, and the name tag were sliding into place. It was as if his attire was being sculpted out of clay. By the time the light was fully on him, he looked the same as before. But I knew what I saw, and Shane recognized his gait. Shane lifted the floor scraper, like a broom with a flat metal head, and he held it out like a spear. He shouted for the guard to stay back. To everyone's surprise, the guard did exactly that. The thing knew it was caught, I realized. It knew that it was caught and it wasn't looking for a fight. And then with the rest of us watching, it changed. Its skin and wardrobe slipped and shimmered like cement being mixed in a bucket. It changed color, too, every part of it. The light hue of its skin and the dark hue of its uniform faded to the same beige as the sand beneath its feet. It was blending into the desert, camouflaging itself like a chameleon. The process didn't last more than a few minutes, and then it vanished right before our eyes. We tried to watch for footprints in the dirt. There weren't any, not after it disappeared or before. It didn't feel real at the time. It doesn't feel real now, honestly. I guess that's why we went back to work. We resumed the night as usual, although our eyes kept jumping to the door, to the night, to the space in the distance where the shape of the guard had first returned. Whatever it was, it didn't come back, and we finished the job early. Our employers were glad to hear us insist that we didn't see anything that night. They wanted to forget it as much as we did and they didn't want word to get out. If it wasn't for this one thought, I guess the encounter would be pushed from my mind entirely. But if it did want to come back, how would I know where it was? How would I know who it was? When I lived in Ohio, I had a job working for the sheriff's department. I remember one of my first duties was patrolling a wooded area. From my understanding, it was one of those tasks that nobody wanted, so being young and new, I was given the job. I didn't realize that I was given the grub work until much later in my employment, but hey, it was an interesting experience. As I understood it, the area was known to attract people who were often up to no good, or doing mischievous business. I had come to think of it as a lover's lane type of an area, but as it turned out, it attracted a much different type of mischief. The night in question was one of those nights, very warm, but kind of humid. This wasn't unusual for Ohio, but the days had been so hot that the rain didn't even help. It just made everything sticky. So what felt like eight hours of patrol 
was actually only two. Time seemed to stand still on this particular night. Maybe it was because I was feeling a little overworked, the week had been especially long, and this specific night happened to be Friday night for me, and I just really wanted to get home. Sometimes if the nights were calm, I would park a while and just relax, basically stop patrolling. This was one of those nights. It was pretty calm, no disruptions other than the uncomfortable feeling of the heat and the wet air, so I paused patrolling and I parked. I know it doesn't sound like the most appropriate thing to do when you're on duty, park and just relax, but I kind of just let myself take the time as a little break. But that's when it happened. I was soon contacted on the radio about multiple reports of an unusual green light just up the road from where I was. I thought, of course, this would happen. I didn't think anything would come of it, but I hopped into my vehicle and I started circling again, patrolling. I figured the green light might best be explained by kids who came to the woods looking for trouble. I circled and I circled, but I didn't see anything like a green light. And then after about an hour or so, I decided to hop out of the vehicle again. I couldn't stand sitting in there despite the humidity outside. Also, now I was bored and I started just flashing my flashlight around into the trees, thinking maybe I could spot the kids. Maybe they had fireworks. I know this story makes me sound irresponsible or like I wasn't working hard, but I didn't know what else to do to keep myself from falling asleep. I was young. Not that that makes a difference. Anyway, I'm shining my flashlight around, I'm looking at some of the trees, and this all gets boring pretty quickly. So I turn off my flashlight and sat on the hood of my vehicle. I even started to text a few friends when I started to hear something approaching me. I could hear the sound of leaves crunching underfoot and some cracking as if branches were being broken. I looked up, but I didn't see anything, so I put my phone down and started looking around. It was dark, and I was surrounded nearly completely by trees. This excluded the area of the dirt path and the strange little parking area that was basically just a piece of dirt, but I still couldn't see anything. If it had been a person, I think I would have seen them by now. The trees were pretty tall, but the trunks were rather thin, so the dense area of leaves started probably about 12 feet up from the ground. So a person would be noticeable, right? Also, I didn't hear any talking or giggling, and that made it even more bizarre. If it had been kids, they surely would be making noise, usually laughing. But all I heard was this strange movement in the distance. I tried picturing pleasant things because I started to get a little freaked out. I told myself it was just a dog in the woods. That didn't seem too scary. I kept looking toward the trees, and then I noticed that one of the trees appeared to move in a strange way like it was swaying at the trunk. You know, when you're out in the dark and certain things look much darker than everything else, well, that's what these trees looked like. They looked darker than everything else, like a shadow of themselves, if that makes sense. And then I realized that the tree that moved, it no longer looked like a tree. It now looked like a very tall person, as in about nine feet tall. It looked like it had shoulders and arms and a neck and all the things that a human would. I told myself I was hallucinating. The dark can do that to people. It's tricky. But then the shadow moved again, and this time I saw a distinct head. But I didn't see a face. Just the shadow of where its head would be. How did I know it was its head, though? Well, I could see eyes. Its eyes were glowing this strange orange color. I was now terrified. What was I to do? What was this thing? I didn't have an answer for these questions. And before I could think, I found myself jumping into the patrol car and speeding off towards town. I started thinking about the reports of the green light and how this strange thing was in the woods. Did both of these incidents stem from each other? Like, did this shadow with orange eyes come from the green light? That wouldn't make much sense, would it? Or Maybe it would. I'm not sure what I saw. I'm not sure if it was a creature from outer space or if it was one of those ape monsters that people always talk about. All I know is it scared a lot of life out of me. 
There's a state park in Illinois that has a whole slew of hidden caves, canyons, and waterfalls. It's a strange place. You wouldn't think to find anything like it in the area, judging by the surrounding deciduous forests and flat, open fields. The park isn't terribly large either, but it's highly trafficked in the summer months. There's a campground and several cabins in the park that are usually rented out many months in advance. This is where I worked as a park ranger for six years. There's also a long tragic history to this park, starting with two warring Native American tribes that lived in the area. I won't get into all of that here, but there have been strange happenings in the park since the very start. A lot of people blame it on Native ghosts who died on the land. And while there may indeed be ghosts here, there is something else here as well. We would get reports from guests about animals damaging their property in the campgrounds and other strange things. Things like tents being unzipped in the middle of the night and things moving around. There was one instance where rocks from a fire pit were placed in a circle around the tent of the guest staying there. Even more confounding was the fact that they had put out the fire late in the evening, so the rocks were undoubtedly extremely hot. The complaints we would get from the cabin guests were that something was knocking on their doors, scraping on their walls, and tapping on the window glass. It was all weird, but mostly harmless stuff, at least harmless in that no one was physically injured. If somebody left anything outside, unsecured though, it could likely be moved. But then it gets really weird. First, I should explain to you a little about the layout of the park. There are several canyons, and most of them are box canyons with no way out. You have to hike in and then turn around and hike out. Most of those canyons have waterfalls of some sort. Depending on the season, the waterfalls can range from a steady supply of water to just a trickle. There are usually stagnant pools of water at the base of the canyons. The waters there are a beautiful bluish green. Gorgeous in photos, but I definitely would not go swimming in them. A few times a year, we would get reports of hikers seeing creatures in these bluish green pools or hearing a voice telling them to go in. Often they would report that it was the voice of somebody they knew, but the person wasn't there. It was all super weird stuff. There wasn't a whole lot we could tell them other than to not go in the pools and keep themselves alert. Like I said, it only happened a few times a year, but it did happen year after year. Most of the reports were from the same three locations in the park. One particular summer, it was extremely hot and we didn't have much rainfall. The pools were shrinking, but we were getting higher than normal reports from hikers. None of the reports were incredibly detailed. I think it was because people didn't want us to think that they were crazy. Most of the time, they would just say they saw something strange in the canyon, or on the trail, or hear something strange, and let us know that we should probably check it out. After the fifth report that summer, I started doing some digging. I pulled up all the reports for the last 10 years, and I marked their location on a map. I don't know why nobody had dug into this before but I found that the locations were all relatively close to caves. That was the only thing they had in common. There's a pretty extensive cave system throughout the canyons, but I'm not sure if it has been explored in detail. Or at least, it hasn't been mapped out recently. Judging from the map, there was a possibility that the caves could be interconnected, but I wasn't certain. There was one canyon, however, that seemed to have the most action, and right next to it were three large caves. So one day, I made an excuse about needing to head to that area so that I could test my theory. I parked my vehicle at the trailhead, and I hiked in about three miles to the first canyon. There were what looked like fish bones all along the edge of the pool there, at the end of the canyon. Now, this was rather strange. I don't think fish would be able to survive in an environment like that. But at least I didn't see any creatures or hear any strange voices. Next, I set out on my mission to explore inside the caves. I brought a handheld flashlight and a headlamp and a rope that I tied to a tree outside the cave so that I wouldn't get lost if the cave had multiple chambers. I headed into the largest cave first. I didn't find anything strange at the entrance, but I quickly realized I had made a huge mistake. I followed the cave for what felt like an eternity, but I'm sure it was only a few minutes. 
and then I heard something move in the distance, and I shined my light on it. I couldn't see what it was, but it looked like there was a nest of some sort in the cave. It looked like a bird's nest, but it was so large that it could have fit a human. It was lined with fresh leaves and grass, and there were bones scattered around the outside of the nest. There were no animals that I knew of that could make any nests like that. I then pulled on the rope to help me find my way back out, to find that it was slack. I tried to pull the slack out, but it was never ending, and that's when I realized that my rope had either been untied or cut. All of a sudden, the air felt thin and it was hard to breathe. I did my best not to panic, and I hurried out of the cave as quickly as I could, and by some miracle, made it outside. I took a quick look around, but I didn't see anything. Yet something out there had released my rope. Sure enough, when I got to the tree where I had tied it, there was nothing there. But something had obviously untied it. I knew I needed to leave. I didn't know what was out there, but I just knew I had to get far away fast. I turned back to give it all one last look, and that's when I saw it, although only for a moment. It was crouched down near the entrance to the cave just beyond the light, and it looked ghostly. I don't know how else to describe it. It was like a human, but it wasn't a human. It had no hair on its body, and it was so pale that it was nearly pure white, like something that had never seen the sunlight. Its eyes were huge for the size of its head, and I didn't see much of a nose. That's when I turned around, and I ran. I ran continuously for nearly the entire length back to the truck, and I never went to that place alone again. Hi, my name is Roy, and I have a story to tell you from my childhood. I grew up with an older brother. At the time this happened, I was seven and he was nine. We used to play all the time in the spring and summer in a very large patch of woods directly behind our house. We spent hours and hours back there playing, playing swords with sticks, building tree forts, pretending to start fires, cops and robbers, you name it. We spent hours exploring, looking at bugs, trying to find buried treasure like any kids do. All the good stuff. We tried to spend the majority of our free time outside when we could, mainly because inside offered us no entertainment. My parents didn't have a TV, no game systems, nothing. We had a few books here and there, but nothing my brother and I were interested in, so we would try to spend all of our time outside and live like real kids do but that changed halfway during a summer when I was seven and he was nine. We were playing outside. I remember we had a game of hide-and-seek going. Well, I was it, and so I counted to 50. This time, before I could even finish counting, though, he comes running back, screaming all the way back to the house. It completely caught me off guard, totally by surprise. Then, I thought he was pranking me or trying to joke with me, so I laughed and I ran after him but he was just bawling hysterically, crying and screaming and running to the back door. I chased after him and tried to get him to slow down, but he didn't. He didn't even acknowledge me. He was in a total state of shock and fear. When he got to the back door, I finally caught up with him. My mom was busy doing something inside, so it took her a minute, if not more, to get to the back door. She usually kept it locked. I had never seen my brother in my life so overtaken by pure, raw emotion as that fear that he had. It wasn't until a little later, even my mom was freaked out, that she was able to get him to calm down. But it was days before he would tell any of us exactly what happened. He just said that he saw something, but we really couldn't get anything out of him. And then days after that, he told me what it was. It was about a week later, and he asked me if I could keep a secret. I said yes. Even more so, being only seven years old, you want to do anything to stand by your older brother. He told me that he saw a real werewolf, and that he was running to hide. He was walking up to him from behind a tree, reaching out to grab him. That's what he said. He said it was big and hairy, covered in dark black fur with huge fangs and large eyes and ears. It scared him so bad that he ran. He was pretty serious about it, too. He was very shaken up. Retelling the story at nine years old wasn't easy. Plus, he had no desire to go back into the woods for the rest of the year, 
which was a huge loss for both of us. We just stayed inside, and we were bored the rest of the summer. Now that we're both in our late twenties, I ask him about it sometimes. He basically just tells me what I've told you already, that he believes he saw some sort of a creature that resembled a werewolf. He's pretty firm in his belief that vampires, mummies, werewolves don't exist, but there are animals out there that have some resemblance to them. I mean, that's a lot more plausible than the idea of an actual werewolf existing. But even now, he describes it to a T, basically says exactly what he did when he was nine. It stood up on two legs, was covered in dark black fur that was really thick, kind of like a shaggy dog, long, gangly, very unkempt, like it had been rolling around in dirt and filth and muck. He said its face was somewhere of a cross between a German shepherd and a wolf, a very pronounced brow ridge like some monkeys have, and very, very long ears that were very pointed, and a long muzzle and huge, sharp canines. This thing was walking towards him, extending both of its arms like it was going to grab him, but it made no effort to run after him or move any faster than at a casual slow pace, even after my brother started running. The whole thing is weird, he says, but it is what it is. The following spring and summer, we continued to play back in those woods, and we never had any problems afterwards. We then moved out of that house and all the way across town when we were 15 and 13. That's my story. Or should I say, my brother's story? I never saw or heard anything. Hi, Lilith. My name is Carl, and I'm a logger living out in Seward, Alaska, part of the Kenai Peninsula. I'm in my 40s now, and I've moved up here in my late 20s after bouncing around a bunch in big cities in the U.S. Like a lot of people living here, I came to Alaska for some peace and quiet. The nature was a huge draw for me. I also like the ability to be self-sufficient. I have a boat docked in the harbor that I take out pretty regularly when I'm not on a job somewhere. Depending on the season and what I'm looking for, I might check out some inlets for waterfowl, go moose hunting, or go fishing. I grew up freshwater fishing, but ever since moving to Seward, I love sea fishing. I live with my wife Janet and our two kids, both of whom are in high school. Every March, the fishing season opens, and I spend a few months bringing in fish whenever I can to stock our freezer. Mine and Janet's favorite is halibut. Halibut is a huge flatfish, and the daily limits are two per person. So sometimes Janet or my older son Christopher will go out with me on the boat. A few years ago, in 2009, I had just finished up a job with my company further north and inland. I was itching to get out on the water, and after settling in at home for about a week, I decided to take the boat out with Janet. It was also sort of a date night for us since I'd been away for almost a month. We took the boat out very early, just as dawn was starting, and headed southwest to some more open water, but not too far off the shoreline since halibut are bottom feeders. We had some frozen salmon heads and squid left over from last season defrosting in a bucket, and Janet and I were setting up the poles and the gear. Fishing's a great sport, but can be dangerous especially in Alaska's waters. The temperatures even in April are freezing, and you can get hypothermia quickly. Not a situation you want to get into if it's just two of you out in a remote area in a boat. As we were setting up, I was letting the boat drift maybe 500 or so feet from the shore. We were just off the coast from Fort McGilvery, a landmark in a heavy wooded area that creates a little point into the bay. I had just stuck my hand into the bucket to check on the salmon heads and squid when Janet said something and pointed towards the shore. When I looked up, I could see a dark shape moving along the beach area. At first, I assumed it was a bear since they like to comb the beaches, but it also could have been a moose or a deer or even a hunter, although I doubted that. I got a little excited but could tell that something was strange with Janet. She was sitting stiffly and staring at the shore. When I asked what was up, she said that something just didn't look right. It was about 5 a.m. now, and we were ready to fish, but she seemed pretty bothered. I offered to drive the boat closer so we could see what it was. She was resistant at first, but hesitantly agreed. She gripped the edge of the boat tightly, and we sped toward the fort and the beach. Meanwhile, as soon as I started up the motor, the creature on the beach turned our way and was checking us out. I expected it to run off as we got closer but it didn't. 
That put me on edge as I was now thinking it was a bear that was too used to humans. These bears can be dangerous and eventually end up trying to break into cabins or getting too close to people in very aggressive ways. So we got to about 200 feet off the shore and I pulled a pair of game binoculars out of my coat. It took a second to get situated, but I got the creature in my sights and realized it wasn't a bear at all. By now it was trying to move into the wooded area off the beach. As I watched, holding my breath, it moved on two feet. Not like a bear, but like a stiff human. Janet then hit my arm and told me she wanted to go back. Hold on, I said. I wanted to get a better look. I didn't dare bring the boat in closer since the water was very shallow here. But I kept my eyes glued to the bipedal creature. It wove in and out of the trees, poking out every few seconds to look back at us. The trees obscured it a bit, but I was able to see longer, shaggy hair on its body, matted in some places. It was a dark, almost black-brown color, and had long arms that reached down past where I would say the knees were. I asked Janet if she wanted to look, but she shook her head and asked again if we could please just head back. In fact, she demanded it. So we switched spots so I could keep looking at the creature while she directed us back out to the fishing spot. As our boat moved away from the shore, the thing came out onto the beach a little further, but not like it had been before. It was a bumpy ride on the water, but I could see that it was beachcombing and would occasionally bend down, again with these stiff knees. When we were far out from the fort, Janet and I started fishing, and we just didn't talk about it until I brought it up about an hour later. I asked if she wanted to know what it was. She said no at first, but then gave in to her curiosity. Plus, we couldn't see the creature on the beach anymore. I explained that it almost looked like a man in a black and brown ghillie suit, but one who was walking strangely. She looked at me and said that she had noticed that too, that the movements weren't fluid like a human, but they were very straightforward, more animal-like. We tried to focus on fishing, but after an hour, only caught one smaller halibut, so she and I decided to head back in. Since that day, we haven't seen anything like the creature again, but I've brought it up over beers in the bar, and I've heard similar stories from other people. Locals in the area seem pretty comfortable with the idea of Bigfoot or something ape-like roaming around. I'm thinking that's what we must have seen. Whatever it was, I didn't get a feeling of menace or aggression about it, more that it wanted to be left alone and just stay unseen. Eventually, Janet admitted that she had heard these stories too, and she'd even heard them growing up, but we never believed that such things existed until we saw it for ourselves. I spent most of my life as a hunting guide on the border of Montana and Wyoming. I did some work for fish and wildlife in both states. During the off-season, I worked as a range rider tracking wildlife populations and making sure the large predators don't get too close to civilization. I was who they called when they had to track and dispatch problematic wildlife for the safety of the public. It's not what I would call a fun job, but I was really good at it. I was called out to northwestern Wyoming to track down a problematic brown bear. The reports of the bear were just outside of Yellowstone. Oddly, no one had directly seen the bear, but it had caused severe damage to vehicles and campers in the area. All signs pointed toward a territorial bear. The local park service tried to track it down before they called me, after having had no success. The most recent report of the bear was from a road crew working to fix some mountain roads that were washed out by recent flooding. Luckily. No one was injured, but the bear destroyed two hard-sided campers that the workers were staying in. That was the last place the bear was spotted, so it was the first place on my list. I'm a little old school when it comes to hunting and tracking, so I drove up there with my truck and horse trailer. I know a lot of guys that use ATVs out here, but a good horse will do you much better. The road up the mountain was windy and slow going. I didn't reach the camp until mid-morning. I saw the damage before I even had my truck in park. The sides of the camper were completely slashed through. Bears can definitely do this kind of damage, but it's not all that common. But every once in a while, you'll get a rogue bear that's just out to get everybody. Like I said, it doesn't happen often, but when it does, 
the only thing to do is to put the bear down. I talked to one of the workers who was in the camper at the time of the attack. He said he didn't get a good look at it, but saw brown fur. Now that means it's a grizzly. He claimed to have shot at it twice with a 12-gauge, dead center in the chest, but said that the bear didn't stop. A charging bear does have a lot of adrenaline in its body. They can be mortally wounded and still maul you to death before they die. There's a good probability that the bear was severely wounded and just ran off somewhere to die at least if this guy was telling the truth. I looked and did find a decent blood trail leading into the forest. I saddled up my horse and set off down the trail, leading her on foot. Had I known that I would be following a track, I would have brought a dog, but the blood trail was substantial enough to easily follow. So from the looks of it so far, I was expecting to find either a dead or nearly dead brown bear very soon. But that was not the case. I followed that track well into dusk. I knew I should have turned back earlier, but I just couldn't imagine an animal that had lost such a significant amount of blood to still be able to go so far. I was in a situation where I would either have to camp or try to travel out through some extremely rugged terrain in the dark. Neither option sounded good to me, but I was too far on this track to give up and come back in the morning. I knew I couldn't sleep out here with a wounded grizzly potentially close by, so I decided to follow the track into the night. The blood on the leaves was still warm, too. This thing was so close, it could probably see me. Certainly smell me. I just wanted to get this bear dead so I could get a good night's sleep out here and then ride back in the morning. Even my horse started getting antsy as we continued on the track. I knew we were nearly there. And that's when I saw a lump of brown fur lying on the forest floor in the shadows. I had my rifle positioned on it, but there was something strange about the situation. I turned the brightness up on my headlamp to get a better look. And the first thing I noticed was that it was still breathing. The second thing I noticed was that its fur, while brown, was not a bear's fur. It was much longer, like something you would see on a yak. I made some noise to see if it would move. I really just wanted to see the face to figure out what it was, but it just laid there. And then my horse suddenly spooked from something moving behind us. I spun around to see what it was, but I didn't see anything between the trees. I looked back at the creature, and it was still laying there in the dirt. And then I heard what sounded like people walking through the forest. It was coming from all directions. And that's when I saw the first one. It must have been seven feet tall, was covered in the same long brown hair as the creature curled up in the dirt. Its face looked almost human, but not quite. Its skin was tan and leathery from what I could tell with my headlamp. My horse was properly freaked out by the sight, as was I, if I'm honest. The creature approached the injured creature on the ground and knelt down next to it. And then another one came from the shadows and joined those two. I didn't know what to do. I knew how to handle an encounter with just about every wild animal out there, but these were something else. It looked like they were trying to help the injured one, and in that moment, I was afraid that they would attack me, thinking I was the one who had shot their friend. So I slowly turned my horse around. The creatures stared at me. I don't know why, but I tried speaking to them. I told them that I was looking for a bear and that I'm not a threat to them and that we were promptly leaving. I can't tell if they understood me or not, but they did let me leave. I rode through the night to get out of there. I continued on working as a ranger rider and a hunting guide for another 12 years after that incident, and I can say I never saw any of those creatures again, but I have heard stories from others. They aren't very often seen, but they are out there. I was working at a wildlife preserve in northern Minnesota. We were working on a project to track the population of fishers in the area. Unfortunately, they had been nearly wiped out in the area several years back, and we were making an attempt to reestablish a breeding population. Fishers are problematic to study. They're solitary animals, and they're difficult to track, trap, and collar. Imagine a ferret on steroids with the personality of a wolverine. This project led me into some pretty remote wilderness areas, 
oftentimes alone. This was one of those times. It was the dead of winter. I had a few live traps set up in an area where we had caught fishers on game camera. Like I said, they're difficult to trap, so I wasn't hopeful to find anything. Still, I had to check them in case something was in there. The trail to get to the traps required a snowmobile to make it through. There were three traps to check, two in a forest and one I had to cross a frozen bog to get to. Luckily, the budget for this preserve didn't allow for one of those nice new snowmobiles, and so I had this machine from the late 70s. I say luckily because this thing was much lighter than the newer sleds, and honestly, that's the only reason I felt comfortable taking it over the bog. I checked the traps in the forest first and found nothing in one, and a raccoon in the other. I released the raccoon and headed towards the bog. I had to drive out of the forest across a prairie area and then down a steep hill to the bog. There was a river running through the area that typically froze in the winter, but I didn't have to cross that. As soon as I got into the prairie, I felt like something was wrong. I couldn't say just what it was. Even looking back, I just sort of knew. I pushed the feeling to the back of my mind, though, and continued on, basically forgetting it. I didn't want to turn around, but I also couldn't leave the trap without checking to see if something was stuck in there. I knew I had reached the bog when I saw the green reeds poking up out of the snow. They were the only bit of color in the entire landscape. Everything else was covered in ice and snow and frozen. I stopped the sled near the trap. I didn't see anything inside, but I smelled something absolutely rotten. We used to use chicken livers for the traps. They're stinky and the fishers like them, but they don't smell this bad. No, there was definitely something else around. I didn't see any animal carcasses near me. In fact, there were no signs of animals at all. Usually when I drive in with the snowmobile, everything on four legs scatters away. But there are usually tracks all over to look at. But this time, there was nothing. The only tracks I found were mine from when I set the trap the day before yesterday. I was just about to get on my snowmobile and go, but then out of the corner of my eye, I saw two elk antlers pointing out of the snow. They were less than 20 yards away from the sled. We do have elk up here in northern Minnesota, but they are rare. This looked to be shed antlers or a skull. It didn't jump up and leave when I came in with the snowmobile, so I assumed it was dead. A set of elk antlers is a pretty neat find, and I wanted to bring them back to the station. But when I approached, the rotting smell overpowered me. Normally an animal carcass won't stink like that during the winter. That should have been my first sign to get out of there. But I decided to investigate further. I really wanted to take those antlers home. As I began to approach what I thought was an elk carcass, something moved beneath the snow. I stepped backwards as soon as I saw it move, but it was tough to move quickly. The creature was slow to rise up from the ground. It moved like it was aged. Its bones clicked and popped, and it was emaciated at best. In fact, I was surprised that it was still alive from the state that the body was in. It had its back to me when it got up, so I hadn't seen the face yet. The fur was as white as the snow. I figured it must be some sort of an albino mutation or something. I got back to my sled and started it up. The elk was close enough that I wanted to put some distance between us in case it decided to charge. And this is when it turned around, and I can't tell you how terrified I was. This thing had fur all over its body, except for its face. And the skin was stripped from the skull. It was just bone from what I could see. And I couldn't see any eyes in the dark sockets, but when it turned to look at me, I know it saw me, eyes or not. I didn't see a lower jaw either. I don't think it had one. There was just this flap of pinkish meat hanging down from its throat. It must have been a tongue or something. I was so afraid I was struggling to grasp the pull cord on the snowmobile, and it took three tries to get it started, all while the creature was fixated on me. It then began walking towards me. Its movements were jarring, like its legs weren't connected to the rest of the body. Sort of hard to describe. But then I got the snowmobile running before it reached me, and I sped off. I kept looking back over my shoulder, but it didn't attempt to chase me. I know what I saw wasn't one of those sick or diseased elk. 
The natives up here have a name for it, but I won't say it here. The legends say that this creature thing is a danger to humans, and I'm lucky to have escaped as easily as I did. I think I woke the beast from a deep sleep, and that must have been why it didn't try to chase me. Hibernation, maybe? I don't know. I don't really know, but I do know that I won't go back into that area alone or without a gun. When I was with the Park Service in West Virginia, we used to host a scouts program. They spent a lot of hours on volunteer projects, and part of their service involved helping to restore parks throughout the county. Our area was a popular place for them to come and do trail maintenance and improve the campgrounds in many ways. Just clearing the area of trash and debris alone was a great service they provided. We were hosting a group like that about five years ago, and that's the year I got more than I bargained for. The age group was between 10 and 12 years old. It was their last camp of the year, and they were making the most of it. They had worked hard all day, and some of their junior assistant leaders put together a night game for them. It was meant to be a kind of spooky game where they could just let off steam after a hard days of work. It involved the kids completing some kind of task while the junior leaders tried to scare them. I was pretty new to the job then, so I didn't know if that was a common activity or not. It was a bit before Halloween, so I was guessing they were just getting into the spirit of the season. Myself and another ranger had given a talk earlier in the evening, and we were just kind of facilitating the gathering and making sure everybody stayed within the boundaries. Some of the assistants had to put on some monster masks, and we were hiding out in the woods close to the checkpoints the scouts had to pass. I was going in between checkpoints, keeping an eye on things. There was an open stretch of forest near the upper boundary where I decided to hang out on this big rock so that no one would go too far. I had my flashlight off, though, so I wouldn't mess up the game. But it was the kind of dark that plays tricks on your eyes, and you start imagining things that aren't there. I was sitting there, and I thought I saw a shadow that was around my size running through the trees a few times. I couldn't see it very well, so I just assumed that I was imagining things, because nothing was there when I turned my flashlight on. I had been there quite a while, and it was getting kind of late. I was pretty sure the game would be over soon and everybody would go back to the fire to have s'mores. But then, I saw the shadow again. This time I could see it vaguely standing near a tree not too far away from me. I thought it might be one of the assistants, hiding to scare the kids. I decided to go over since it was about time to go back. I was still some distance away. But when I got closer, I aimed my flashlight toward the tree. There was definitely someone very tall standing there. But when my light hit its face, I was shocked to see reflective red eyes looking back at me. I started to feel dread. Something felt off. I started to ask if everything was okay, but then I saw that this thing had huge black wings that covered most of its body. My mind tried to rationalize it away. I tried to tell myself that it was just someone who had decided to use an elaborate costume. But I knew it wasn't true. This thing wasn't human. Besides the red eyes, it didn't seem to have any facial features, just darkness. Plus, it was taller than me by about a foot. It lifted up its wings and it made a god-awful piercing shriek. And it jumped straight into the tree behind it where it could look down on me. It was slowly turning its head back and forth like it was waiting for something else to come. Something inside me told me just to run. It didn't matter if it was just a stupid prank. I felt this unholy fear. If it wasn't a prank, I felt like I was in serious danger. I ran as fast as I could. I thought I heard it following me in the trees, but I couldn't take the time to look around. I arrived back at the campfire, and it looked like everybody else had already gotten back and was just milling around, laughing and joking. I went and found the other ranger there and told him what happened. He just looked weird at me thinking I was making it up. He had been employed there longer than me. I felt like he was looking me up and down, like I was dumb, like a dumb whippersnapper who didn't know how to act in the woods. I just shut up after that, and I started to question my own sanity. Everybody else was just having a good time, but my adrenaline was really jumping. I just kept circling the camp and shining my light into the woods whenever I thought I heard anything. 
Eventually, the party died down and everybody went back down the trail to their tents. I stayed by the fire, a good long time, thinking I had chosen the completely wrong kind of work. The next day, I went back to that area to check it out, but I never found anything but endless trees. Well, I mean, I did find a big black bird carcass, but that could have been from anything. It's not like it was the first one of those I had ever seen. In spite of that creepy night, though, I did stay with the job, even though I did end up leaving that area the next summer. I ended up with the city parks department in New York City. Now, there are some stories, plenty of freaks up there, too. I'll tell you about it later. I was just a normal person living a normal life until one day the government came for me. They said that I had been selected for a special program and that I was going to be part of a scientific study that could change the world. They said I was an exact match for what they were looking for. I was excited because actually I had volunteered for the program. How I heard about it is a story for another day. They promised me that I would be well taken care of and reassured me that I would be helping to find the cure not to mention the sizable monetary stipend that I would receive when it concluded. Little did I know that this would be the worst decision of my life. First came the paperwork, signing off on pages and pages that made me second-guess what I was getting myself into. And then a few weeks later, I was picked up and taken to a well-hidden and probably top-secret facility deep in the woods. Riding there in the limo with the blacked-out windows should have been a red flag, but at the time, it made me feel special. But getting out of the limo felt like a different story. Here was where the rigorous poking and prodding began, and that wasn't even the study. That was just to check one last time that I was 100% compatible. I was eventually told that I was accepted, but would now have to sign off on staying at the facility. No leaving no contacting anybody outside for the duration of the study, which was slated to take three months. I was deep into it at this point, so I agreed. The experiments began, and at first they seemed harmless enough, but as time went on they became more and more extreme. I was subjected to a series of genetic manipulations and treatments that made me uncomfortable, and soon I started to notice changes in my body changes that were not at all what I was expecting. But they told me not to worry. But how couldn't I? My senses became heightened, my strength and speed increased, and I began to develop thick, coarse hair all over my body. I also started to experience strange urges, like the need to run outdoors, and even stranger still, a craving for raw meat. I knew something was wrong. Something was terribly wrong. I tried talking to the doctors, if they even were real doctors, now I wasn't sure, but I couldn't get anybody to listen or react. There was a lot of hush-hush talking that went on between them, and often they had concerned looks on their faces. I then asked to leave the facility so that I could find help on my own, but I wasn't allowed to leave and it was pointed out to me that I had signed the papers that agreed to that rule. I couldn't seek help, and my mind was starting to lose it. Now I won't reveal how, but one day, I tried to escape. Let's just say it was somebody from the inside that seemed to be just as worried and as scared as me. However, I didn't get far out of the building before they were upon me, and restraining me, and pulling me back inside. I was thrown into a locked room and kept away from all other patients. Almost like solitary, I would say. The next morning, three of the white coats came into the room. Two held me while the third injected me with a series of shots. Each shot burned more than the last. I started to sweat and to feel faint. I was fading fast and I was barely able to watch them leave. But I did hear one of them say, werewolf, and they left. The next few days were excruciating as my body felt like it was on fire. I could barely sit up, let alone stand. The pain was so intense that eventually I passed out completely. I have no idea how much time passed after that. But the next thing I knew, I was waking up back at home, in my bed. You can only imagine how that scared the you-know-what out of me. The questions in my head were endless. 
not the least of which was, how did I get back here? And would they be coming back for me? I never imagined that my participation in a scientific study would lead to this. I feel betrayed and used by the government, if that's who they even were. And I can't help but wonder how many other innocent people are going through the same thing. People like me, people who were available to give themselves to this. It's a nightmare that I can never wake up from. But those people are much, much more power than me in that building. So I'm just moving forward with my life, trying to forget it all. Oh yeah, and by the way, my body seems to be mostly returned to normal, although the hair on my arms and legs continues to grow dark and thick, but not in a furry animal kind of a way. So I'm just living with it for now. My wife and I just returned home from what should have been a romantic weekend getaway to upstate New York. It was anything but. We were coming up on our third wedding anniversary, and as a gift, I decided to surprise her with a weekend trip to Lake George. Since it's not exactly tourist season, I got a good deal on a beautiful cabin for three nights. It was actually built on one of the small islands dotting the lake, and we would have to take a short boat ride to get to it. My wife was totally surprised, and after we tied up the boat to the small dock on the shore, we got to exploring. The island itself was small, a few hundred yards wide at best. The cabin was spacious, though, and it had an old rustic charm. Artwork of the lake and surrounding area lined the walls. We had gotten here just as it started to get dark, and after a quick dinner, we called it an early night. We were beat after the long car drive and boat ride. The next morning, I woke up early before my wife. I made a pot of coffee and I stepped outside. Enjoying the brisk air, I took a walk down to the shore to check on the boat and make sure it was still securely tied. And that's when I noticed something odd. The ground around the little dock was soggy from the constant lapping of the small gentle waves. Around the boat, there were strange footprints in the dirt. They weren't from a shoe. They were narrow and elongated. What looked like a set of four thin toes jutted out from a shallow heel. No animal came to mind, but then again, I'm not much of a naturist. I chalked it up to some kind of local fauna that I wasn't familiar with, and I returned to the cabin to wake up my wife to have some breakfast and a day out on the lake. We took the boat out for a while. It wasn't particularly cold, so we stayed out a bit longer than we planned. When we returned to the cabin, we grilled some food and after dinner decided to have another cup of coffee and sit on the chair by the house. We both fell asleep. I'm not sure what it was that woke us up, but the first thing I noticed was that it had gotten much colder. I looked over at my wife in the light. I could see the tip of her nose was red. And as I went to shake her awake, I caught a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye, down towards the water. I felt a pang of panic. Somebody had come out onto the island. Like this was going to cause us some trouble, maybe. But there wasn't any help that would get to us quickly. Our cell phones didn't even have service, and there was no landline. I shook my wife as I looked over her shoulder, trying to get a better look at whoever it was. And just as she was waking up, a gust of wind blew the branches overhead, causing an opening for the moonlight to shine down on the water's edge. What I saw shocked me. A pale, thin figure was crawling out of the water and onto the beach. It had two arms and legs that I could make out, and a head that was too large for its frail body. It didn't have any eyes as far as I could tell, and I could have sworn that I spotted a pair of gills along each side of its throat. My wife was waking up now, and I slapped my free hand over her mouth. Of course, this startled her, and I could see an angry flash in her eyes but the look on my face quickly turned her irritation to concern. I nodded my head in the direction of the creature. She slowly turned to look, and I could feel her body go rigid when she saw it. The creature was roaming around now, slowly along the shore, seemingly aimless in its plodding. I whispered for my wife to follow me, and we quietly rose from the chair and began slowly stepping back towards the house. In an unfamiliar setting and with full attention on the creature, I accidentally bumped into the grill we had cooked on earlier. The metal spatula had been resting on top and it fell, 
clattering to the floor of the small paved patio that the grill was on. The clang sounded like a gunshot in the silent darkness, and the creature snapped its head in our direction. We both froze, waiting to see what would happen next. But almost immediately, the thing opened its mouth and let out a piercing scream, like a small child trying to scream while gargling. I grabbed my wife by the arm and I pulled her behind me, sprinting towards the house. I guess she had thrown a look over her shoulder as we ran because she was now screaming, It's coming! I didn't bother to look and instead dashed the last few feet, clinging to my wife. I threw open the door and tossed her inside, coming in just after and slamming the door shut behind me. The door was solid oak, and there were no windows on this wall, but there was a series of small raps at the door, followed by another squeal. We both stood frozen, too afraid to make any noise or move. After a few minutes of silence, we heard one last scream, further away, thank God, from the direction of the shoreline, and then that was it. We spent a sleepless night huddled on the couch in complete terror, praying for the sun to rise, and as soon as it did, we grabbed our belongings and ran to the boat deck. We had the boat loaded, and we pulled out into the lake in less than three minutes. I spent the whole ride back to the main shoreline waiting for a sickly hand to come over the side of the boat, but nothing ever materialized. We got back to the office and dropped the keys with the clerk not even explaining our early checkout. We didn't even ask for a refund. We have no idea what it was we saw that night. And frankly, I don't really want to know. I just want to share my experience with you and warn everybody else that there is something very inhuman living on or in Lake George. Hey Lilith, I'm a firm believer in the supernatural. I know it's real and I've had a few experiences to back it up. I was born and raised in Hawaii, and while it's mainly known as a tourist paradise with beaches, mountains, surfing, and luau's, there's also a dark side that most aren't aware of unless you live there. Hawaii is ripe with history, folklore, and spirituality, and there are hauntings all over the islands. Popular spirits include Madame Pele, the goddess of fire, the Menehune, the Choking Ghost, the Faceless Woman of Waialai Drive-In, and the Green Lady of Wahiwa. One of the scariest encounters that I've personally had involves the most legendary ghosts of all. In Hawaiian, they're the Huaka Ipu, but are more commonly known as the Night Marchers. Anyone who lives in Hawaii has at least heard of them. They are very real. The night marchers are the ghosts of ancient Hawaiian warriors said to travel on certain trails from sunset to sunrise. Supposedly, they appear during the last four phases of the moon, before it goes dark. It's said that you'll know when the night marchers are coming when you hear their drumbeat and the sound of the shell. You'll see their torches in a single line descending down the mountains. That's your cue to run and hide. You're not supposed to look at them. If you do, they will pull you in and you'll be doomed to walk with them for eternity. You're supposed to show deference and respect by taking your clothes off and laying face down in the ground. If you do look at them, it's possible to be saved by an ancestor who is marching with them. The ancestor will call your name and claim you as theirs, and your life will be spared. Simply put, these are not the kind of spirits to be trifled with. One summer weekend, my cousin and I were camping and boar hunting. I won't say where, because it's best if people don't try to go there. It was near the base of a mountain, and we had to hike a few miles after parking off a dirt road. On our first day, we bagged a boar and cleaned it, then we cooked some of the meat for dinner. We had a few beers afterwards and just talked story, laughing into the late hours of the night. There were no clouds, and the tapestry of stars was a sight to behold. The moon was just a sliver, but I didn't think anything of that at the time. We eventually went to sleep, but a few hours later, my cousin violently shook me awake. I didn't recognize him at first in my half-asleep stupor, and I almost punched him in the face. But I quickly saw the terror in his eyes. I had never seen him as scared as he was in that moment. He told me to shut up and listen, and that's when I heard it. A slow, steady drumbeat, and then the sound of the shell blowing. It was in the distance, but not too far away. 
I looked at him in disbelief. I think I may have even laughed, but he yanked me up with one arm and he pointed at the mountain. Through the trees I saw it. It looked like floating fireballs streaming down the mountain in a single line. It was them, the night marchers. From out of nowhere, we were hit with a wave of warm air as the drumbeat grew louder and louder. We got up and ran, abandoning our campsite and blindly plowed through the jungle. The sound of the shell blowing was now closer, and out of my peripheral vision I could see a soft orange glow. A mist began to surround us, and we were assaulted with the horrid stench of something rotten. My cousin screamed at me to get down. I knew I was supposed to take my clothes off, but there was no time for that. So I just dropped to the ground face down, and I closed my eyes. My heart pounded in my chest as I waited there for what seemed like forever. I felt the warm air wash over me as the drumbeat was finally upon us. But I couldn't help it. Curiosity got the best of me, and I peeked through my fingers. All I could see was the ground in front of me. I was enveloped by a swirling mist that glowed orange from the torches that the night marchers carried. I caught glimpses of legs walking right past me. But they didn't have feet. Against my better judgment, I looked up. I will never forget what I saw. They were apparitions, shadows of towering men dressed in traditional Hawaiian warrior garb, capes, and helmets. They were obscured by the orange glowing mist, so I couldn't make out their faces. They all carried torches in one hand, spears and other ancient weaponry in the other. But then the drumbeat stopped, and they halted, turning to look at me. I felt this weird floating sensation and everything began to spin like I had vertigo. I started to black out, but not before I heard a voice call out my name. I don't know how long I was unconscious, but I woke up to the sound of my cousin yelling for me. The night marchers were gone, and it was dark under a canopy of trees. I got up, and I saw my cousin twenty feet away. I flagged him down. He gave me a big bear hug. He said he was afraid I was lost forever. I somehow ended up pretty far away from where we initially dropped face down. I had no recollection of what happened, other than the brief glimpses I caught when I stupidly looked up at the night marchers. My cousin and I went back to our campsite, waited for dawn, and then we packed up our things and we got out of there. We told our tutu what happened and she said I was very lucky. She confirmed that our family was descended from the Hawaiian warrior class and that an ancestor claimed me saving my life. Strangely, that experience gave me a new sense of pride about my heritage. As a culture, Hawaiians revere the land, what we call the Aina, and there's a strong spiritual connection. The Aina deserves our respect, and if we don't give it, we may open ourselves up to a reckoning that we are not prepared for. Joining the Coast Guard had been one of my dreams ever since I was a teenager. So as soon as high school was over, I enlisted. I was stationed on the North Oregon coast in the Tillamook Bay area. When I think about it, I was so young and energetic back then. I couldn't think of anything I'd rather be doing as a young person, but of course, I enjoyed my downtime too. When we got a weekend off, I liked to explore the area. I wasn't from Oregon, so everything there was new to me. One weekend, a group of us decided to check out a beach that some had never been to. There were four of us that night, two guys and two girls. We weren't exactly couples, we were just hanging out. We got to the beach and made a small bonfire, which I'm not even sure if we were allowed to do, and we planned to camp, or really just stay out all night, out near some dunes. It was chilly that night, but the fire felt great. It was kind of an out-of-the-way spot, so we anticipated that we wouldn't see many people, and hopefully, no one at all. That night turned out to be quite dark, too. There were a few houses a little ways off, but they had their lights out, and all you could see were two street lamps in the distance. We'd been sitting out there for hours when the other couple went to get more blankets from the car. It was parked just on the other side of a sand dune, so a bit out of sight. It was probably about three in the morning at the time. I was lying next to the fire on a sleeping bag I had brought when I heard this high-pitched yelping noise that seemed to be getting progressively louder. It turned into this screech that really sounded alarming. We thought it must be an animal, but then it started sounding more human-like. 
Then the two of us at the fire still jumped up, thinking maybe it was our friends back at the car. We sprinted towards them and intercepted them at the sand dune just as they were heading back to us. They had heard the screeching noises too and thought maybe one of us had been hurt. We could still hear the noises coming from the direction of some nearby trees and we debated how smart it would be to check it out. We tried to pinpoint where the screaming was coming from, but it was hard to tell the exact direction. It seemed to be coming from every direction, and the sound of the ocean wasn't helping much either not to mention the darkness. We made our way back to the campsite once the screeching had stopped, but we didn't use our lights because we didn't want to identify our position. We only got a few yards along when we heard a deep cough. We all stopped. It was impossible to see anything, but we could hear shuffling noises too. We stayed hidden behind some of the brush until we heard what sounded like dragging, as if something heavy was being pulled across the surface of the sand. At this point, my imagination was going wild at what might be happening out in the darkness in front of me. And then we heard a noise again, and at that point, I was getting a strong urge to run. We were about to turn around when, all of a sudden, this huge beast appeared between two of the trees. It sure wasn't anything normal. It stood upright and was between seven and eight feet tall. At that point, I went ahead and I turned on my tactical flashlight. I needed to have some idea of what we were dealing with. The thing was covered with reddish-brown hair, and it looked to be soaking wet. And it looked like a giant, a Neanderthal or something. We stopped and just stared at it. It had a heavy brow ridge and pronounced lips. It had beady black eyes and was staring toward us, even though my light must have been blinding it. It had hold of a large animal, too, which I can only think was probably the dragging sound that we heard. From what I could tell, it appeared to be a dead sea lion. Presumably, this huge creature had been out in the ocean, hunting. When I shined my light on it, it started bellowing, and at that point we all simultaneously turned around and hightailed it out of there as fast as we could. We all got in the car and drove up the road toward where the few houses and streetlights were, and we just sat there, under the light. We figured that if we were near streetlights, we could see that thing coming if it was inclined to follow us. We were scared crapless, and we just kept throwing out theories as to what in the hell it could have been. Honestly, the closest we could agree on was that it resembled what we imagined a Bigfoot to look like. But all of us had the same thinking. How could that be? Because even though Bigfoot hadn't been proven... We've only ever heard of it in the depths of forests. It seemed crazy to think that we might have spotted one that had been hunting in the ocean. We stayed in the car until sunrise. It was already like four in the morning anyway, so it was only another hour or so. The entire time we kept a lookout for any sign of movement. Any sign that it was nearby. And then at the crack of daylight we headed back to the beach to make sure the fire was out, gather any last items, and continued out of there. I did feel obligated to report it all to my chief petty officer. He asked quite a few questions, and I gave him all the details I could remember. His reaction was fairly low-key, and it was hard for me to tell what he really thought. But I figured that I'd done my duty, and they could now make their own determination as to if an investigation was necessary. I did keep a close eye on the news for any reports for a while afterward, but nothing ever came up. My family always longed to travel. When we were kids, we couldn't afford it. My mom, a single mom, would always talk to us and dream about all of the sites in the United States that she hadn't yet had the opportunity to see. We wanted to see those things too. So once we siblings got older, we made a list of all the places our mom described and promised that we'd all make our way through the destinations, one at a time. We took her to a few of them. She enjoyed Crater Lake the most, but unfortunately, she didn't get around to the Grand Canyon until after she died. So, let me explain. Once Mom died, my siblings started to give up on the list. It wasn't the same without Mom, they said. I felt the same as the rest of them, but I just wasn't ready to give up yet. The road trips across the country to check out the last remaining wonders of the USA became my way of staying close to her. I'd even talk to her on the road. I'd ask her what she thought of all my favorite views. 
When I finally made it to the Grand Canyon, it felt bittersweet. It was the last destination on my list, and my list represented my mom's bucket list, complete now thanks to my dedication. But it also meant that I'd have to find a new way to bond with mom. While there, I started to think about how I wasn't ready to say goodbye to these trips. So I booked an extra long stay in the area so that I could return to see the canyon one more time before heading home. The first day was exactly the wonder and spectacle that you would expect. You don't know how small you are until you're faced with the great scope of the earth. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time describing the canyon. I'm not good at that kind of thing. But what I do want to describe is what I saw on the second day. Dusk was approaching. The descending light framed the rocks and the sand beautifully. It was different than the broad daylight view that I had enjoyed on my first day. So I asked Mom what she thought, and I waited for an answer. I never heard her voice. We don't talk that way. Usually I'd just get a feeling. That night I did receive the feeling that she was there, but it was interrupted by a light in the distance. I was alone at that particular overlook. I had purposely chosen a less crowded area to admire the canyon. The light demanded my attention, especially since it wasn't coming from the road in the distance or the town that I knew was further back. Red blinking lights began flickering near the bottom of the canyon. I thought perhaps there was a road down there. It was an emergency vehicle, maybe. Maybe I hadn't seen them descend into the canyon. The idea of somebody being rescued out of the bottom of the canyon guaranteed that I wouldn't be looking away. It was unexpected, magnetic, but it was not a vehicle at the bottom of the canyon. I know this because the longer I stared, the more I saw it. There was a large triangular shape visible on the canyon floor. The blinking red lights revealed more of it as time went on. Otherwise, its colors were obscured. It looked disguised in some way. It was as if the triangular body was colored exactly the same as the canyon around it. Now I wondered if it was a jet, some type of military craft, in disguise. No, it wasn't flying and I had no reason to assume it could be, but jets were the only vehicles I knew of that depended on such great stealth. And then the triangle began to levitate. As it rose from the ground, its canyon-colored veil seemed to disappear. Now it looked black. Black, metallic, and massive. I mean, it could have parked my car on its back and still had room to walk around. I watched as it climbed out of the canyon and continued to climb. I asked my mom if she was seeing the same thing. Again, there were no words, no feelings, but I felt confident that she was there with me. There's no way she would let me face this alone. Besides, someone would have to believe my story. I was already repeating how unbelievable this encounter was in my head at the time. The longest point of the triangle then turned and seemed to fixate on my position. The red strobe changed its pattern. And now I'm wondering if it was trying to communicate. I've tried to learn Morse code ever since that night, but I can't perfectly recall the way the lights were blinking. I only remember feeling glued to it. I was like a moth being pulled to a flame. This craft and I stared at each other. It seemed to be waiting for something. I can't explain it, but I suddenly felt my mom more strongly than before. It didn't just seem like the craft was observing me. It felt like she was looking down from somewhere up above. Imagining her in that ship instead of somewhere in heaven? made me smile. She would have had some great views from inside that thing. And then the vehicle dashed into the night, tore towards the clouds at a blistering speed. Didn't make any sound, either. The next day I asked around, there were a few reports of strange shapes in the sky. I wasn't the only person with their eyes watching the Grand Canyon, after all. What I want to know was, why did I feel the way I did? Why did I feel like she was there with me? Has anybody ever talked about that before? Was it something genuine? Was I in shock? Was it even real? I want to know the theories, and I want to know if I should go back looking for it again.
I had always reminded my daughter, Ashley, to be cautious when we would head out on family camping trips, especially when her young son, Jimmy, my grandson, came along. He was only four years old on our most recent trip. That was me, Ashley, her husband, Jimmy, and my dad, five of us. Originally, going camping was how we coped with the passing of my husband, which happened before Jimmy was born, and it just continued as a family tradition. We went to the same camping spot every time, a tucked away campsite with access to a creek and a small waterfall. My husband had called this spot his real home. We'd spent lots of time there over the years, even before we had been married. Every time we went, my husband brought along a small dream catcher that he insisted would keep bad spirits away. I sort of laughed it off, thinking he was just being superstitious, but I didn't mind. Whatever made him happy made me happy. He loved and believed in that dream catcher so much that I even had it buried with him. My dad loved to take Jimmy down to the creek to play in the water, same as he had done with Ashley. This trip was no different. The day we arrived at the campsite, the first thing he did was take Jimmy down to the water. While I was unpacking, I could hear Jimmy laughing and splashing in the water. I could hear him talk about all the little fish he could see. He was even counting them and laughing when they would jump up to greet him. I loved listening to it and kept thinking about how much my husband would have loved to have known him. And then just as I opened and laid out the last sleeping bag, Ashley and her husband walked over. They had to head back to town. The drive into town was about half an hour, but they would also have to walk on foot about 20 minutes back up to where we had parked. They realized they had completely forgot Jimmy's pull-ups for playing in the creek. I'll keep an eye on them, I told them, smiling in the direction of the boys in the creek. My dad was stooped over a bit. He was getting a little old for these trips, but I knew he wouldn't miss it for the world. So Ashley and her husband took off in the direction of the car and left me standing there, setting up the grill as I listened to my dad and his great-grandson enjoying the great outdoors. I pulled some fish from the cooler and began prepping the grill. I knew they would come back hungry, and I wanted to be sure that lunch would be ready. The grill was positioned so that I had my back to Dad and Jimmy. I was confident that they'd be fine without my eyes watching them the entire time. I mean, my dad, after all, was an adult. As the fire in the grill crackled louder, however, Jimmy's laughter seemed to sound further and further away. So I turned back around and I looked down towards the creek. Nobody was there. I thought they must have moved upstream a bit, but before putting the fish on, I figured I should go check. I decided to give them a shout and let them know that lunch was going to be ready in a bit. I headed down the embankment and instantly noticed something odd. My dad was sitting on the edge of the water with his head down and his eyes closed. Jimmy was nowhere in sight. Dad, I yelled, running down to him. He was startled but acted like nothing had happened. Oh, boy, I just had to close my eyes. The heat was really getting to me. And then he looked up. Where's Jimmy? I began to panic. Where was Jimmy? I shouted Jimmy's name and I ran up and down the creek, but there was no response. I told my dad to head back up to the camp and sit and wait for Ashley. I had to start searching. I walked up the creek and then back on the other side. I looked at the ground for anything that might tell me what had happened, but nothing. I kept yelling Jimmy's name with no response. My grandson had disappeared into thin air. After two hours of searching, my daughter returned to find my dad sitting in the camp chair waiting for her. He told her Jimmy was missing and that I was out looking for him. She immediately ran down to the creek, freaking out, found me on a rock, crying. Where is he? Ashley said, with tears in her eyes. All I could do was shrug. I was defeated. Ashley and her husband began tracing all the steps I had previously taken. Her husband eventually got in the car and headed back to town to alert the police. I couldn't figure out how Jimmy could get that far in the short amount of time that I didn't hear him laughing. I was praying and crying, and suddenly all the surrounding noise began to disappear. I was going into shock. And just then, we heard laughing further down the creek. I scrambled to my feet. We all rushed towards the sound. And there, in a small cave-like opening between three boulders, was Jimmy. You could barely see him, but his voice showed us where to look. He was talking fast and laughing like he was playing with somebody. Jimmy! We all screamed, and Ashley reached inside to pull him out. 
He resisted, and he said he wanted to stay inside playing with his new friend. I started to reach for him to hug him tight, but just then, I saw it, and I could not believe what I was seeing. In his hands was my husband's dream catcher, in perfect condition, just like the day I laid it in his coffin. You don't think, Ashley started to say, realizing how ridiculous it sounded. We stared at each other as the police sirens approached in the distance. Do you think it was Dad? I'm sure you've heard that we all have a doppelganger somewhere in the world. That's something that has been told to me personally at least a dozen times in my life. It's always said by someone who seems to have a little bit of scientific basis for the claim, but has never presented it as a fact with any kind of proof. You've probably also heard from people who claim to have met their doppelganger, or maybe you've even seen yours. So with that in mind, what I'm about to tell you will probably seem underwhelming at first, but I promise this was more than a doppelganger. This was some cross-dimension weirdness that I have never been able to wrap my head around. In August of 1996, I was a 10-year-old kid with a 13-year-old brother and a 6-year-old sister. Our dad had died earlier in the summer in a car accident. He'd been on his way to the store for my mom, who had forgotten to buy milk during the weekly grocery trip that morning. Mom had a really hard time with it, not only with losing dad, but also blaming herself for having to send him back, even though it wasn't her fault at all. As a result of blaming herself, she had slipped into a depression, a funk. My older brother had been doing most of the parenting for the last few months, even though he was barely a teenager so we were a very different family than we had been just months earlier. At the time of Dad's death, we had been planning a family trip to Disney World. Mom was committed to taking us still, even in her emotional state because it was something Dad had been looking forward to, and she'd promised us kids. So in August, as planned, we got in the car and took the drive down to Orlando from Atlanta, where we lived. It would be about a a six-and-a-half or seven-hour drive. The day we got to Disney started out seemingly normal for a day there. We went on rides, saw the sights, and just generally enjoyed ourselves as much as we could. It wasn't until the haunted house ride that things started to get strange. That ride is surprisingly sentimental. After watching the ghosts, who were still in love and dancing through the walls with the loves of their lives, Mom needed a moment to herself. So she took a seat at a food station and sent me, my brother, and our sister to meet Minnie Mouse, who was scheduled to make an appearance shortly at one of the photo tents. We were waiting in line when suddenly we heard somebody call our names. A male voice. It sounded just like Dad. We turned and we looked, and there he was. Our dad, frantically scanning the crowd for us. We all froze. We didn't know what we were looking at, but we knew we could all see it and that we weren't just imagining it. I whispered to my brother, is that dad? And he just shook his head and said, it can't be. But it was. He saw us and he started walking towards us. My little sister ran over and jumped up into his arms, crying and hugging him. He was comforting her, saying it was okay, that he knows it's scary to get lost, but he was right there the whole time. I looked at my brother and he looked at me. We both knew that something very weird and potentially dangerous was going on. My brother ran over and grabbed my sister out of the dad lookalike's arms. I ran with him, and then we all took off as fast as we could back to where we had left mom. The guy took after us, chasing us the whole way. When we got to mom, she stood up and in a hurry asked what we were so scared of. She could see it on our faces. My sister was crying, beating on my brother's back the whole time he ran with her, screaming for him to let her down because she wanted to see Daddy. So when we got to Mom, and my sister was screaming, I want Daddy, over and over, Mom thought that the haunted house had bothered her, too. She took my sister in her arms and was saying, Daddy's in heaven, but he can still see us, though. She was trying to comfort her and calm her down, but it wasn't working. My sister pulled back away from my mom and then said, Daddy's right there, and pointed back into the crowd. Mom looked. She saw him, too. The man that looked like Dad was standing there, staring at Mom, with his face as white as a sheet. And then he was shaking and starting to cry. 
Mom looked at him with the exact same expression. She said, Eric. The man looked and said, Laura. Both of the names were right. And then at the exact same time, they both shook their heads and said, You died when you went to get the milk. That's when three kids who looked just like me and my siblings came running through the crowd, yelling for their dad. He turned and saw them and gave us one last glance before he took off, grabbed them, leading them away before they saw us too. We didn't stay long at Disney after that. Mom hurried us out and we went to the beach and then SeaWorld for the rest of the day. And we never really talked about what happened that day until earlier this year, after cancer took Mom away. We were all older now. My brother, sister, and I started talking about the Disney run-in the day after Mom's funeral. And we all had different ideas about what it could have been. My brother thinks it's just a wild coincidence that some people who looked very similar to our family and had at least a few of the same names and circumstances happened to have been there at the same time. Well, that's ridiculous. That's impossible. My little sister thinks it was a ghost and that the doubles of us were something that we just imagined in order to make sense of what had happened over the years. Personally, I believe that somehow we crossed dimensional paths with ourselves our own family, living in mom's alternate world of what if? What if she had gone for the milk that day instead of dad? What if she had never felt the need to blame herself for what happened? I guess we'll never know for sure. But I do know this. What we saw was very real, and it has affected me every single day since. So... I go to college over in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and last semester I had the most terrifying experience of my life, just outside of one of the frat houses off campus. This is what I saw. You can decide for yourself if you want to believe it or not. It was January, the start of the spring semester, and some friends of mine were throwing this huge party to welcome everyone back. I was having a great time, honestly, for the majority of the night. Something that I noticed early on when I first arrived was that there was garbage scattered everywhere in the front yard. All the trash bags and cans had been toppled over and torn into. Obviously, I assumed that this was because of some animal, but it was actually insane how much trash was scattered about. I mention this because not only was the yard of that frat house trashed, but so were the yards of nearly every other adjacent house on the block. It seemed like Whatever was messing with the garbage was hungry. Coming from a rural area myself, we had a lot of times where we had an unwelcome stay from a family of raccoons, or even the occasional bear. But it was never as bad as the way that block looked, so much so that everybody I was with that day commented on it. And then, that was the last I thought of it, until later. A few hours later, around midnight, I went out on the porch for a smoke with my friends. And that's when I noticed that the porch reeked like urine and something else that I couldn't put my finger on. I assumed someone partied too hard and peed on the porch as a joke or something. I don't know. I couldn't think of any other reason other than that. So we are out there for a little while when all of a sudden we hear a yell coming from the opposite side of the yard, from the front side of the house. It takes me a second to register what the hell is going on but my friends run back inside and try to see what the fuss is about. So there I am, alone on the porch, with no idea about the impending weird stuff that I'm about to witness. I hear a distant conversation, yelling, but I'm not paying too much attention to it. I'm just sort of looking out into the yard, smoking. Then, I see it run by. Coming from the front of the house is a creature that is big, massive even and sprinting fast as hell. In fact, it was so quick that at first I didn't even have the slightest idea what it looked like, only that it was speeding right through the yard, and that it was big. And then it stops. It stops right near the edge of the yard where the forest starts. It sits there for a moment, and even though it's dark, I managed to finally get a decent look at it. It was some kind of a wolf, dog, a combination of both. Just the grossest thing you could imagine, sitting there on all fours and frothing at the mouth. I choked. 
It scared the crap out of me, and I just choked on my cigarette with the loudest, most obnoxious cough you've ever heard. Well, of course, that was a huge mistake. With that, the creature snapped its head towards me, and now we are making eye contact. I thought I was going to die, honestly. My nerves were shot. I just kept hoping that maybe somebody would come back outside and check on me or something. I couldn't move. I wanted to yell, but I knew that if I did, it would probably set the thing off somehow. So I kept quiet. And as I'm looking at it, the freakiest thing happens. This wolf, it gets up and it stands on its hind legs, still staring at me. Now I really think I'm losing my mind because as big as I thought it was before, now the thing is standing at least seven feet in the air. Taller than me. Taller than any person I've ever been next to. It was so confusing to look at, really. But I wasn't so messed up that I didn't know what I was seeing. I could tell this was not normal. It had these crazy eyes, like glowing, human eyes on a dog-like head. I told you already about how tall the thing was. But it wasn't just tall, it was also jacked. Its odd, human torso was insanely muscular. Which explains how it moved around so quickly, I suppose. I just didn't fully comprehend its anatomy. Even the human parts had fur, and even the animal parts looked vaguely human-shaped. We just sat there for a moment looking at each other. I stood as still as I possibly could, and as boring as that might sound, I think it worked. Eventually, I won the staring match, and that monster thing just sort of became bored, I think. Lost interest in me. It turned around and it ran straight into the woods without so much as a second glance. I'll never forget that thing. Its eyes, the novelty of it all. I still go to school there in Michigan, so who knows? Maybe I'll run into that thing again. If I do, I'll certainly give you an update and let you know about it. One good thing, though, I think we figured out the mystery behind all that torn up garbage. And it definitely wasn't a family of raccoons. I don't really remember much, but I'll try to give you as many details as possible. It was just such a surreal experience that I second-guess myself on almost everything. At this point, I've probably gone over it a million times in my head, trying to figure out if I even believe myself. I've decided that I do believe what happened, and that's why I'm passing my story on to you. I guess here's why I think that it's actually real. I don't drink. I don't do drugs, and I don't watch scary movies even. I have a strong mind, and I trust my senses. And for that reason, I really do think that what I saw was real. But it's hard to not second-guess yourself when you experience something so out of the ordinary. So my wife and I were driving back from the movies. It was really late because we had gone to the drive-in. They don't start until the sun sets, and we had also stayed for the second movie, the double feature. So since we did that, we weren't on our way back home until after midnight. Also, the drive-in theater was about an hour from our house, so it was going to be very late by the time we got home. Most of the drive was on the highway, but there were some back roads once we got closer to home. And they were truly back roads through dark woods. There were no street lights, no house lights, not even light from the night sky. It was overcast, and the only real light was from our headlights. That, I believe, is why the other light stood out so clearly. It has stood out the most in my mind as I have gone over the details of the encounter over and over in my head. We didn't see the light head on. I actually noticed it in my rearview mirror. It was weird to see in the rearview mirror because the light was red. So I knew right away that it wasn't like the headlights of another car coming on us. It was red and fairly small, and it also seemed very, very stationary. It sat in the lower right-hand corner of my mirror and didn't really move at all. The light was visible in the mirror for probably two minutes. We were just driving along and it stayed in that lower corner that whole time. But then when we went around a bend in the road, the light suddenly disappeared momentarily. I wondered if maybe it was an emergency vehicle or some other vehicle out of the ordinary, but we just couldn't hear the siren. But then, when we were back on the straight section of road, the light appeared again in the mirror. 
and this time it was bigger, which made me instantly think that whatever the light belonged to was now closer to us. I thought it was all a little weird, but not scary yet. But it started to get scary very quickly after that. Over the course of just a few seconds, the light began to grow noticeably bigger, still in the rearview mirror. It was illuminating the warning notification that was now popping up on my mirrors, which was beginning to make me very uneasy. You know, that objects in mirror are closer than they appear message. The red orb was gaining on us quickly, until suddenly it seemed like it was right behind us. I could now see its glow casting shadows on my dashboard. My heart was hammering at this point. I wanted to speed up and drive away as fast as possible, but the road was windy and I was afraid of getting off in a ditch in the dark. Obviously, my wife was seeing all of this too, and she was also freaking out. The thought of a carjacking entered both of our heads. She was begging me to go faster, which I was trying my best to without losing control in the dark roads. She was clutching my arm in fear so hard that it hurt. I dared to quickly turn around to get a better view of it, and I could see it. The red orb was right behind us probably only 10 feet from our bumper. And that's where my memory of the whole thing stops. The next thing I knew, my wife and I were sitting in our car, but we were pulled over and parked on the side of the road. We were both upright in our seats with our seat belts on. I had both hands on the steering wheel. And the strangest thing of all, the sun was rising. I don't know what happened, but I do know that I was absolutely terrified, and so was my wife. I remember her screaming my name, begging me to drive faster. I remember how tightly I was gripping the steering wheel. I remember how I could barely keep my eyes on the road ahead of me, trying to watch whatever awful thing was coming up behind me in the rearview mirror. And then, nothing, until we were parked, looking at the sun. My wife suggested maybe we drove through some strange chemical field, maybe let off by a local farmer. But of course, that didn't really seem plausible but our minds were trying to come up with anything. We were so tired that we decided we couldn't drive all the way home and had pulled over to sleep. No, that didn't make sense for so many reasons, including how could we have both had the same dream? And who sleeps with their seatbelt on gripping the steering wheel? No, that explanation doesn't make any sense to me. I think that something happened that we don't remember. That whoever or whatever the red orb was It was trying to catch us or overtake us. And I think it did catch us, and something happened that we don't remember. And that's really scary. Like I said, I've questioned this experience a lot. I've tried to figure out any logical explanation, but I can't. There's just no way my wife and I had the exact same dream. So this is my first time writing it all down. Up until this point, I've just thought about it and talked about it with my wife. But now that I'm writing it down, it really seems extra real. And I'm 100% sure that something strange and unnatural, supernatural even, happened to us that night. When was the last time you looked at Mars? A year ago, my answer would have been basically never. But now I look at it almost every day. I can't help myself. Specifically, I'm looking at its moon, Phobos. And then sometime last year, I learned about the monolith on Mars. And if you haven't heard about it, check it out. It's a real thing. In all of the reports I've found, government bodies try to minimize the significance of the monolith. They either describe it as far smaller than it really is, or they describe the perfectly rectangular object as a naturally occurring phenomenon. I know there's nothing natural about it. I've seen the pictures. I've done the math. The structure is over a mile long. How many straight lines have you seen in nature that cover that kind of distance? Around that time, when the monolith was first brought to my attention, I started asking the exact questions that Buzz Aldrin himself asked. Who put it there? And where are they? That's what I was trying to answer. In 1960, the special space advisor to the president suggested that Mars's moon Phobos was actually a satellite launched long ago by an advanced Martian race. Martians might not exist in the capacity that 1980s sci-fi movies once thought, 
but the monolith does at least suggest that some form of life was modifying the surface of Phobos. I wanted to see what else was changing. I didn't hear about the structures beneath the surface until recently, until after my research got scary. Whatever's lurking below the surface of Phobos, I haven't seen it, but I did see something else. And something saw me, too. The Phobos images are available to the public. Just look up the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and you'll find them. I wasn't satisfied with those photos, though. Mars was at its most visible last December. I used a Celestron to get the best view possible. I thought, if I couldn't study Phobos for a night, at least I could study the surface of its planet. What I captured was unremarkable. I didn't see little green men waving back at me, if that's what you're expecting to hear. I was disheartened by my discovery, or lack thereof. So that night, as I laid in bed, the house shook. A loud siren pulled me out from underneath my covers, and I thought I was experiencing an earthquake. None of my neighbors felt it, and when it happened again the next night, I knew something was targeting me. At the time, I didn't consider that it was related to Phobos. But then, I found the monolith. I found a replica of it, anyway. On the second night, I discovered that the wooden chairs that completed my dining room set had been broken. They were reassembled on the floor into an upright triangle. I knocked it over in my panic. The house shook again on the third night, and this time the siren was accompanied by a bright red light shining in through my windows. I found my couch standing on end. Another rectangular pillar. Another monolith. I left that time. I wasn't going to stick around to be harassed, especially after my neighbors had denied seeing or feeling anything both times that I asked. I found a hotel and I figured I would be safe. I wasn't. I fell asleep after a few drinks and when I woke up, the room was red and the siren was blaring and I felt like the floor was shaking. That was when I realized that the light and the sound weren't affecting my environment at all. They were only targeting me. Only I could see the red light. Only I could feel the ground quaking. Maybe it was an auditory attack, something to disorient me and cause hallucinations. I've read about that kind of thing in the past. I didn't have time to research it then. When I woke up, there was another pillar. Even though I fell asleep on the bed, I found myself standing with my arms folded over my head and my chin pressed down to my chest. I was the rectangle. I was the monolith. I didn't know who to tell. I went to the hospital, and I was quarantined. I don't suspect that it looked suspicious to anyone besides me. Lockdowns, quarantines, and CDC intervention became pretty commonplace over the last few years. I was put in a private room, and I only spoke with one doctor. He wore a hazmat suit. He injected a milky liquid into my IV, and the next thing I knew, I was awake at home. I don't remember what he asked me. I only remember his face. I don't remember what happened next, either. I only remember being back here. The siren stopped, and the red light stopped, and the monolith went away. But how am I supposed to move on? How am I supposed to forget what happened? I started looking at Phobos again. Whatever was going on, I knew it was connected to that first pillar. The antenna of a satellite, I wondered or a transmitter of some kind. Did it know when I was watching? Does it know now? I don't think that injection was harmful. Maybe it just made me immune to the sound. No more hallucinations is a good thing, right? If I had any sense, I would go back to living a normal life. I'd be one of my cozy, sane neighbors. Instead, I'm searching, still. I'm here, asking you what you think happened. You've seen the monolith, haven't you? You've looked at a picture of Mars and its moons. Do you ever think they'll come back to me? I was part of something for a short while. I was part of a mystery bigger than our world, and I can't just give that up. I can't give up on answering the questions. If Phobos is a satellite, who put it there? If an advanced alien race really did exist, where in our solar system did they go?